At the entrance to Rosilli, we pushed the conductor's bell and stopped the bus and walked with springing steps the few hundred yards to the village. We've done it in pretty good time, said Ray. I think it's a record, I said. Laughing on the cliff above the very long golden beach, we pointed out to each other, as though the other were blind, the great rock of the worm's head. The sea was out. We crossed over on slipping stones and stood at last triumphantly on the windy top. There was monstrous thick grass there that made a spring healed, and we laughed and bounced on it, scaring the sheep who ran up and down the battered sides like goats. Even on this calmest day a wind blew along the worm. At the end of the Hampton serpentine body, more gulls than I'd ever seen before cried over their new dead and the droppings of ages. On the point, the sound of my quiet voice was scooped and magnified into a hollow shout, as though the wind around me had made a shell or cave, with blue, intangible roof and sides, as tall and wide as all the arched sky, and the flapping gulls were made thunderous. Standing there, legs apart, one hand on my hip, shading my eyes like Raleigh in some picture, I thought myself alone in the epileptic moment near bad sleep, when the legs grow long and sprout into the night, and the heart hammers to wake the neighbours, and breath is a hurricane through the elastic room. Instead of becoming small on the great rock, poised between sky and sea, I felt myself the size of a breathing building, and only Ray in the world could match my lovely bellow as I said, Why don't we live here always, always and always? Build a bloody house and live like bloody kings! The word bellowed among the squawking birds. They carried it off to the headland in the drums of their wings. Like a tower, Ray pranced on the unsteady edge of a separate rock and beat about with his stick, which could turn into snakes or flames. And we sank to the ground, the rubbery, gull-lined grass, the sheep-pilled stones, the pieces of bones and feathers, and crouched at the extreme point of the peninsula. We were still for so long that the dirty grey gulls calmed down, and some settled near us. Then we finished our food. This isn't like any other place, I said. I was almost my own size again, five feet five and eight stone, and my voice didn't sweep any longer up to the amplifying sky. It could be in the middle of the sea. You could think the worm was moving, couldn't you? Guide it to Ireland, Ray. We'll see W.B. Yeats, and you can kiss the Blarney, and we'll have a fight in Belfast. Ray looked out of place on the end of the rock. He would not make himself easy and loll in the sun and roll onto his side to stare down a precipice into the sea, but tried to sit upright as though he were on a hard chair and had nothing to do with his hands. He fiddled with his tame stick and waited for the day to be orderly, for the head to grow paths and for railings to shoot up on the scarred edges. It's too wild for a Tony, I said. Tony yourself, who stopped the bus? Well, aren't you glad we stopped it? We'd still be walking, like Felix. You're just pretending you don't like it here. You were dancing on the edge. Only a couple of hops. I know what it is. You don't like the furniture. There's not enough sofas and chairs, I said. Ah, oh, you think you're a country boy. You don't know a cow from a horse. We began to quarrel, and soon Ray felt at home again and forgot the monotonous out of doors. If snow had fallen suddenly, he would not have noticed. He drew down into himself, and the rock to him became dark as a house with the blinds drawn. The sky-high shapes that had danced and bellowed at birds crept down to hide two small town mutterers in a hollow. I knew what was going to happen by the way Ray lowered his head and brought his shoulders up so that he looked like a man with no neck, and by the way he sucked his breath in between his teeth. He stared at his dusty white shoes, and I knew what shapes his imagination made of them. They were the feet of a man dead in bed, and he was going to talk about his brother. Sometimes, leaning against a fence when we watched football, I caught him staring at his own thin hand. He was thinning it more and more, removing the flesh, seeing Harry's hand in front of him, with the bones appearing through the sensitive skin. He lost the world around him for a moment. If I left him alone, if he cast his eyes down, if his hand lost its grip on the hard, real fence or the hot bowl of his pipe, he would be back in ghastly bedrooms, carrying cloths and basins and listening for handbells. 
I've never seen such a lot of gulls, I said. Have you ever seen such a lot, such a lot of gulls? You try and count them. Two of them are fighting up there. Look, pecking each other like hens in the air. What'll you bet the big one wins? Oh, dirty beak. I wouldn't like to have had his dinner, a bit of sheep and dead gull. I swore to myself for saying the word dead. Eh, wasn't it gay in town this morning, I said. Ray stared at his hand. Nothing could stop him now. Wasn't it gay in town this morning? Mm. Everybody laughing and smiling in their summer outfits. The kids were playing and everybody was happy. They almost had the band out. <laughs> I used to hold my father down on the bed when he had fits. I had to change the sheets twice a day for my brother. There was blood on everything. I watched him getting thinner and thinner. In the end, you could lift him up with one hand. And his wife wouldn't go to see him because he coughed in her face. Mother couldn't move. And I had to cook as well. Cook and nurse and change the sheets. And hold father down when he got mad. It's embittered my outlook, he said. But you loved the walk. You enjoyed yourself on the common. It's a wonderful day, Ray. I'm sorry about you, brother. Let's explore. Let's climb down to the sea. Perhaps there's a cave with prehistoric drawings, and we can write an article and make a fortune. Let's climb down. My brother used to ring a bell for me. He could only whisper. He used to say, Ray, look at my legs. Are they thinner today? Look, the sun's going down. Let's climb. Father thought I was trying to murder him when I held him on the bed. I was holding him down when he died. And he rattled. Mother was in the kitchen in her chair, but she knew he was dead. And she started screaming for my sister. Brenda was in a sanatorium in Krykenos. Harry rang the bell in his bedroom when Mother started. But I couldn't go to him. And Father was dead in the bed. I'm going to climb to the sea, I said. Are you coming? He got up out of the hollow into the open world again and followed me slowly over the point and down the steep side. The gulls rose in a storm. I clung to dry, spiked bushes, but the roots came out. A foothold crumbled. A crevice for the fingers broke as I groped in it. I scrambled onto a black, flat-backed rock whose head, like a little worm's, curved out of the sea a few perilous steps away from me and, drenched by flying water, I gazed up to see Ray and a shower of stones falling. He landed at my side. Oh, I thought I was done for, he said, when he had stopped shaking. I could see all my past life in a flash. All of it? Well, nearly. I saw my brother's face clear as yours. We watched the sunset. Like an orange. Mm, like a tomato. Like a goldfish bowl. We went one better than the other, describing the sun. The sea beat on our rock, soaked our trouser legs, stung our cheeks. I took off my shoes and held Ray's hand and slid down the rock on my belly to trail my feet in the sea. Then Ray slid down, and I held him fast while he kicked up water. Come back now, I said, pulling his hand. No, no, he said. No, this is delicious. Let me keep my feet in a bit more. It's warm as the baths. He kicked and grunted and slapped the rock in a frenzy with his other hand, pretending to drown. Don't save me, he cried. I'm drowning! I'm drowning! I pulled him back, and in his struggles he brushed a shoe off the rock. We fished it out. It was full of water. Never mind. It was worth it. I haven't paddled since I was six. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. He had forgotten about his father and his brother. But I knew that once his joy in the wild, warm water was over, he would return to the painful house and see his brother growing thinner. I had heard Harry die so many times, and the mad father was as familiar to me as Ray himself. I knew every cough and cry, every clawing at the air. I'm going to paddle once a day from now on, Ray said. I'm going to go down to the sands every evening and have a good paddle. I'm going to splash about and get wet up to my knees. I don't care who laughs. He sat still for a minute, thinking gravely of this. When I wake up in the mornings, there's nothing to look forward to, except on Saturdays, he said then. Or when I come up to your house for lexicon, I may as well be dead. But now I'll be able to wake up and think... This evening, I'm going to splash about in the sea. I'm going to do it again now. 
he rolled up his wet trousers and slid down the rock. Don't let go. As he kicked his legs in the sea, I said, This is a rock at the world's end. We're all alone. It all belongs to us, Ray. We can have anybody we like here and keep everybody else away. Who do you wish was with us? He was too busy to answer, splashing and snorting, blowing as though his head were under, making circular commotions in the water, or lazily skimming the surface with his toes. Who would you like to be here on the rock with us? He was stretched out like a dead man, his feet motionless in the sea, his mouth on the rim of a rock pool, his hand clutched on my foot. I wish George Grey was with us, I said. He's the man from London who's come to live in Norfolk Street. You don't know him. He's the most curious man I ever met. Queerer than Oscar Thomas. And I thought nobody could ever be queerer than that. George Grey wears glasses, but there's no glass in them, only the frames. You wouldn't know until you came near him. He does all sorts of things. He's a cat's doctor, and he goes to somewhere in Sketty every morning to help a woman put her clothes on. She's an old widow, he said, and she can't dress by herself. I don't know how he came to know her. He's only been in town for a month. He's a B.A. too. The things he's got in his pockets. Pincers and scissors for cats and lots of diaries. He read me some of the diaries about the jobs he did in London. He used to go to bed with a policewoman. She used to pay him. She used to go to bed in a uniform. I've never met such a queer man. I wish he was with us here now. Who do you wish was with us, Ray? Ray began to move his feet again kicking them out straight behind him and bringing them down hard in the water and then stirring the water about. I wish Gwilym was here too, I said. I've told you about him. He could give a sermon to the sea. This is the very place. There isn't anywhere as lonely as this. Oh, the beloved sunset. Oh, the terrible sea. Pity the sailors. Pity the sinners. Pity Raymond Price and me. Oh, the evening is coming like a cloud. Amen, amen. Who do you wish, Ray? I wish my brother was with us, Ray said. He climbed onto the flat of the rock and dried his feet. I wish Harry was here. I wish he was here now, at this moment, on this rock. The sun was nearly right down, halved by the shadowed sea. Cold came up, spraying out of the sea, and I could make a body for it. Icy antlers, a dripping tail, a rippling face with fishes passing across it. A wind cornering the head, chilled through our summer shirts, and the sea began to cover our rock quickly, our rock already covered with friends, with living and dead, racing against the darkness. We did not speak as we climbed. I thought, if we open our mouths, we'll both say, Too late, it's too late. We ran over the springboard grass and the scraping rock needles, down the hollow in which Ray had talked about blood, up rustling humps and along the ragged flat. We stood on the beginning of the head and looked down, though both of us could have said without looking, The sea is in. The sea was in. The slipping stepping stones were gone. On the mainland, in the dusk, some little figures beckoned to us. Seven clear figures jumping and calling. I thought they were the cyclists.